Afternoon, everyone. I know it's been a long day, but I have a lot of interesting things to talk about, which is about 3D, but not directly about 3D. It's really about everything else that it takes to make 3D into a very functional and realistic uh, experience to, to be able to eliminate artifacts and everything else. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what is perception. How do we see things? Because obviously everyone understands the 3D part of it here, but there's a lot of other aspects to this. So how do we perceive light and color? So illumination, occlusion, reflection, shading, all those things are our cues that tell us what shapes the objects are in. And of course, many people may have seen this. This is one of those optical illusion puzzles, but if you look at A and B, your brain says, no, A is darker than B, but when you actually connect the dots, they're actually the same color. It's just one of those things that we see, you know, it, it tricks our brain into seeing things. Here's another one. I mean, everyone can see that there's a brown square on the top center of the cube and there's an orange one on the bottom center of the cube. But when you take away the other distractions, they're the same color. So it's just one of those things, our brains trick us into seeing things that aren't what we think they are. It's kind of a, unusual thing. So here's another one, different color balls. I think most people would see some greenish and bluish and beigeish balls. But of course, as we zoom in closer and closer, we discover that the, actually the balls are exactly the same color, but it's the other lines that give us clues. So when you see it like this, you see different colors, but when you go forward, you realize they're not. So there's a lot of things that we see that are optical illusions and confusion. So this is another one, just another area where we see things that aren't there. The white dots or are they black dots as you look at the, at the pattern. And of course, there's differences between additive and subtractive colors. You know, growing up as a kid, kids are taught that primary colors are yellow, blue, and red. So as I was raising my kids, I would always say, it's all about red, green, blue. And they're like, what are you talking about red, green, and blue? It's, it's red, <laughs> sorry, it's, it's red, yellow, and, and cyan, or red, yellow, and blue. And I'm like, and I had to sort of think about that for a while. And actually, when you think about it, if you look at the subtractive colors, magenta is really kind of red-ish, and the cyan is really kind of blue-ish. And that's the, uh, what, how uh, it's, taught of that. So this is the visible spectrum. I took this picture with our photospectrometer at work. And if you look at it, you don't see white anywhere. But we clearly see white. So we've created these constructs, these ways of trying to explain color. And there's you know, secondary colors, primary colors, and complementary and split complementary, et cetera, et cetera. There's all these different methods and approaches to try to explain what color is. But when you look at light, it's actually like we're looking at radio waves, only they're the waves that our eyes are able to see. It's all part of, part of the spectrum. But if you look everywhere on the visible spectrum between somewhere between ultraviolet and infrared, you still don't see white. So, where is the color white and what is the correct color? The reason why I have these pictures of Star Trek here, most people will used to see Kirk and say, yep, he was wearing a gold shirt. But actually when CBS and when the, the show was, uh, NBC actually originally, but when it was uh, first on, uh, the actual correct color was supposed to be a yellowy green. It was supposed to show off red, green, and blue for the new color TV systems. Of course, that was all back during NTSC when the colors were never twice the same color. <laughs> and when they remastered uh, this for a episode of Deep Space Nine, they actually corrected the color to be the proper green. Now this was more green on this particular shirt than the other shirts, but it's actually very green. When they remastered, they've actually corrected it because we now have TVs that can actually show, show this with more detail. So the Planck and Locus, 
This is the CIE 1931 color chart developed actually in 1931 by a group of very brilliant scientists, although things have come along a long way since then. But if you look at this line, there's this extra little line here. This is actually Plaquenil locus. That line defines the color white. Now, they started doing that based on heating up metal. And when metal got white hot, that's how they determine the color white. Of course, as it's cooling down or different colors, we see it as different colors. But there's also white that's in daylight, which is over here. So the question is, they were trying to figure out how do they define what is white? What is correct white color? And what they ended up doing was taking a white cotton sheet outdoors on a sunny day, and that is how the color white is defined for what's called D6500, or illuminate D. And cinema has chosen a different white. They're both perceived as white. I have a LG TV, I have an OLED TV at home, and I took my photo spectrometer to it, and I wanted to see what it was doing. And it was white, but it was way out here. It was way out 12,000 Kelvin. But my brain still sees it as white. And it's one of those, it's, it's a really interesting artifact. So then I'm gonna talk about a little bit more about color. So I'm, I'm specifically talking about projection, although this applies to LED illumination as well. There's, there's different color spaces, but I'm specifically talking about projectors. Uh, today we actually have a Rec. 709 projector. It's a Christie, uh, Christie Mirage projector, but it uses a mercury lamp, which is limited to Rec. 709. But there's other lamps that do P3. Laser phosphor also is a 709 or P3 variant, but when you want to get into the full color, which is much closer to what we see as humans, we need to have a, an RGB system. It allows us to get brighter and a number of different things. A lot of people don't understand that laser phosphor projectors are not RGB pure laser projectors. They just use a blue laser that illuminates and makes a yellow light from it, and the yellow light is then split into red and green, giving us the red, green, blue. So there have been different standards, and there's, as I mentioned earlier, there was like NTSC and, and EGA and CGA and all the other, other standards that have come before it. Rex 2020 represents the largest triangle here, and that is actually much closer to what we see as human beings. This, the CIE 1931 again, this represents all the colors that we can see in the spectrum with white sort of being that mix of all the light in the middle. Rec. 709 is down here, it's a much smaller, so the, the red is definitely much less red. The green is much uh, less green than the greens up here. On the screen, it looks the same. The green looks the same because the projector cannot reproduce those colors. So it just looks the same. And of course, there's photopic response. And our cones see different colors. So our red cone actually sees red, green, and a little bit of blue. And the green cone sees red and blue as well. The blue doesn't go, it blues only into the into the green and red, or green and, bl and uh, blue spectrum. But those are how our eyes see things. And of course, there actually is, according to scientists, a di women see things differently than men. It's because of our, it, it's, things do appear a little more yellower to men than women. And I've had a lot of discussions with my wife about what color the couch is. Is it purple or is it brown? And we've had lots of discussions about those things. But these are one of those things that we actually do see things very differently. But there's also this thing called metamorism or metamorism, depending on how you want to pronounce it. That is actually a very interesting phenomenon. I was in a uh, group with 20 different people, and each one of them are what I would call golden eyes, people that really understand detail and see color and see, see things. And we stood in a room, we had two projectors set up, one was a lamp-based projector, one was a laser-based projector, and we, we matched them according to the meter. And people would, then we asked the question, how many people see this one as being more red and this one as more blue? And 60%, 70% of the group went like this. And the other group saw it the exact opposite. And it was just like, and it wasn't a men and women thing, it was actually just people see differently. So when you're trying to match color, there's a whole different level of details that you're trying to see. So this is mercury illumination. This is the illumination we have in the, in the projector today. Uh, there's 
less saturation in the red. There is definitely more in the green and the blue spectrum. When you look at, this is a laser phosphor projector with a red boost. So this actually has a separate LED, red laser, which allows us to get into the better reds. But normally a, a laser phosphor projector is doing blue as a pure laser, and then it splits the red, which is sort of an orangey red. And then of course there's pure laser. Now all these scales are a little bit different, but as, if you remember the photopic response, the red can be much higher energy, although we don't see very much in that long red. So you have to have a lot more energy. That also puts out a lot more heat. Now we don't see infrared, but we can feel it, but that's where you have to pump a lot more energy into the red to get a better red. Now this, this is the most unfortunate part of my presentation today because we're looking at this on a projector that can't reproduce these colors. The best way to show this is actually multiple projectors side by side. So we've kind of faked an image because you can't really show it. So this represents what a Rec. 7 or 9 space is. It's not very saturated. The DCI-P3, which the cinema grade, is like this. And you see a lot more red and a lot more greens and blues, much more detail on, on these. And of course, it matters when, especially if you're getting into Coca-Cola red, they are looking for real red. Or when Disney is doing their characters, they're looking for very specific colors. I'm gonna talk about contrast. Contrast is one of those things that's also not really understood. The text is actually white. It's a white screen, but our brain sees it as black. But the text is actually white, at least on a projector. If it was an LED, it'd be different. Because it was a direct view display, we'd be actually looking at nothing in the areas where the text was. But in a projector, our brains look at that and go, no, no, that's black text. Well, that's actually a white screen, so it's really white. So what are the different illumination levels? So you can look at direct sunlight, well, preferably not into the sun, but in direct sunlight, you're looking at 100,000 lux. And really, when you're out in the middle of nowhere at night with no moon and no light pollution, it's very, very low illumination levels. And our eyes can adapt for any amount of these levels, but not all at the same time. So th that's really the key is our contrast. So if you're in a movie theater and you're, you know, you watch a movie during the day and you walk out and suddenly you're in the daylight, you can't see anything because your eyes have, have completely dark adapted. So one of, the, one of the fun ones, why do pirates wear eye patches? That is correct. Most people think it's because they got poked in the eye and everything else, but that is actually the exact correct answer, which was tested on Mythbusters. Now, of course, we have no actual evidence because there's no records of it, except for that is the reason, and they prove that if you have one eye that is dark adapted, you can go under the deck immediately and see what you're seeing, as opposed to when you're up on the, on the deck in the high seas. So I thought, Kind of interesting thing. I'm not really going to talk about 3D because I think we all know that. Of course, there's active and polarized systems like what we're looking at, what we'll be looking at today and tonight. And then there's 6P 3D systems or color comb systems. That refers to having multiple bands of light either in the projector or filtered out of the projector, and you get exceptional 3D extinction. So it's having two different bands of blue, two different bands of green, two different bands of red, although they are slightly different red, green, and blue bands. When our brains put it all together, even though when, if you close one eye and the other eye, you can see a slight color shift. When you just watch content, your brain normalizes it and it becomes very, very 3D. Now, if you put a filter in a, a lamp-based projector like what we're looking at today, we're actually blocking out all of this light. The scales are not exactly correct, but when you look at this, all this light is blocked that's not one, on one of these bands. So that's why it's much more efficient to have a laser-based projector with a color comb system because you're not generating light you don't actually, uh, you're actually able to use all of the light out of the projector as opposed to a lamp-based projector which is like a fire hose of light, like what we're looking at today. Only you put a filter in it that blocks 
80% of the light leaving the projector, so it makes it very, very inefficient. Of course, field of view. When you're creating 3D content, how to determine what field of view. This is all related to all, all of these factors. So our field of view is much wider. Of course, if you did a fisheye lens that showed you whatever you see on a film screen, it looks really terrible. So you have to choose how much field of view, and then there's the interocular offsets between the, three, between the eyes, et cetera. But you also have higher resolution at the center of your eye and lower resolution at the sides of your eye. However, you have better flicker perception or, de or flashing perception on the edges of your eye and very, very high fidelity in the center with low flicker uh, perception. So there is, the, the way you see, in, especially in 3D, it also applies into that. So there's one example. This is a, uh, a cave at Los Alamos National Labs where each, each of these is an edge-matched projector, but their rear projection on the floor, all the walls, this is a uh, high frame rate. As an earlier image, this is only 96 frames per second. This is a uh, video where we replaced their power wall, and we took out our original projectors, and some of these were like serial number one, two, and three. I mean, these were like the earliest Mirage projectors that we made. We took down this wall, which was a, an array of projectors all edge matched, and we decided, or they decided, they really wanted to have it big and blended. The problem is this was inside of an existing building, which was a skiff. We couldn't knock a hole in the wall and bring a piece of, single piece of glass in. We bought three panes of glass inside the room, 40 projectors behind the wall, each one running at 120 frames a second, 3D. So it's double stacked for brightness because they're LED illumination, but we couldn't even bring a key fob for our rental car into the building, but of course they were able to take a video and give us the video, but we couldn't bring, because it's a secure building, we couldn't even bring anything with a battery and anything with electronics, and everything that goes in never came out, but in the end it was all blended and a really nice beautiful display, and it's at 32 megapixels at true 120 frame rate. So the question is how much, how many megapixels can we see? Do we see 4K, 8K? 8K is the big rage right now. Everyone's all excited about 8K. Everyone thinks, oh, that must be what we can top out at. Or is it 32K like that wall? Well, the reality is it's actually much, much higher. That's what our brain, that's what our optic system can actually capture. It's a much higher resolution system. 576 megapixels, give or take a few, um, is what the latest, latest understanding of the human visual cortex, the human uh, seeing system. So of course, as you increase the detail, uh, there's also temporal resolution. I'm gonna talk about that. So there's static resolution. This is obviously lower res, higher res over here. And it combines the spatial and temporal res resolution together to make everything really work. So arc minutes per pixel, in the last presentation she was talking about uh, extremely small degrees of view, but arc minutes per pixel or arc minutes per optical line pair, that's actually the, the right way to determine the amount of resolution on your screen. Now for those of you sitting towards the back, the screen will be higher resolution than those of you sitting towards the front because your number of degrees that you're seeing are much fewer from edge to edge. And this also relates to frame rate, and I'll talk about that in a little bit as well. So seating position is one of the most critical factors to determining how much resolution is the right amount of resolution. Of course, there's also how it was shot. Was a good quality lens or a bad quality lens? What is the frame rate? And I'm gonna, again, talk about temporal or dynamic resolution. The screen surface itself, how good is the screen at, at dispersing that light? And of course, the camera lenses and everything else used to shoot the film and post-processing. All these things impact fidelity. A Little bit about HDR. First of all, HDR, another unfortunately very overused and misunderstood term. First of all, there's HDR photography, which has a very non-natural look to it. It can be a beautiful look, it can be a great look, and I actually do uh, my own high, uh, HDR photography. 
but HDR in projection or displays is very different. Unfortunately, it has, no, it has lost all of its meaning because people associate HDR with a standard, not with an actual performance of a system. So there is a standard out there called HDR10, there's Dolby Vision, there's other standards, HDR10+, plus. there's other standards out there for quote unquote HDR, and unfortunately people say, oh, I have an HDR projector because it takes HDR10 signals. That just means it can decode signals, doesn't mean it can actually properly display them the way they were intended. So I think that's one of the, it's a very important thing that often gets lost. So it's brightness, it's specular highlights, it's the contrast, dark things are really dark. Obviously in a lit room like this, it's not the most optimal environment for really seeing details in both. Hopefully this comes out a little bit, it's not wonderful, but the image over here is a full HDR image. And this is what ends up happening when you have a projector that is, or a display system that is not capable of, of having very many levels of contrast. So as you, as you increase the, the detail, or as you in, increase the contrast range, you actually increase the detail as part of the process. So now black is truly black, and the whites are brighter than ever. So it allows you to have these wonderful colors, but also gives you details, fine details and specular highlights. Very important thing. So if you look, you'll see this image. It'll step through a couple different steps. You can always tell it's a... It's an engine, that's, that's easy, but it's which looks more realistic and it's having these specular highlights, these little details really make the difference on, on the vehicle looking more and more photorealistic. So when you're creating 3D content, it's also part of that. Creating, it's all about creating realism. If you're trying to create realism, if you're trying to create art, that's a different subject. But if you're really trying to create realism, Having these additional details, these subtle, subtle cues are what really make a difference for all of us. So of course, we, again, here's the CA 1931 chart and the color space inside of it. However, when you look at it, it's actually a 3D volume of color. It's actually a volumetric model. And so when you look at things in a true volumetric method, you'll see that there's a lot more color potential. There's colors out here that you cannot get to with a smaller color space. And unfortunately, we look at it, we always see it in a two-dimensional, in a two-dimensional way. So here you look at sky blue and you say, oh yes, we could easily hit sky blue in our color space, no problem. The problem is when you have a mix of all your contrast and content on the screen, sometimes that sky blue is out of range and it becomes gray. So when you're mixing a movie, you can color, color time and correct for certain colors that exist, but you can't hit all of those colors unless you have a larger color volume. And of course, the gradient. And you really need, as you increase the contrast of the projector, you really must have higher bit depth. Eight bits is just not enough for higher contrast projectors. The lower the contrast, you can have fewer steps in between and it still looks smooth. But the more and more contrast you have, the more and more fidelity you have, having only eight bits to spread that light out, to spread those steps out, becomes much more apparent. So it's because of RGB laser illumination that allows us to really get to true HDR projection and really get to that larger color volume so we introduced a projector last year um, called the Christie Eclipse. And it is truly, and we've had independent labs come in and verify this, it's not a marketing spec number, which is the bane of our existence of the industry, but we're actually able to have a light point that is 20 million times brighter than the black on the screen. So black is truly black and the bright is truly bright. Now, of course, as you start to lighten up the whole space, just the way our room is bouncing light in the room, it washes out the contrast. But if you have a light controlled environment, a theater space that's dark, a theme park, uh, any kind of environment where you have light control, you actually can get much more realistic imagery. But another reason why HDR matters, there's no optical filters that are needed for doing blending. Because when you have an array of projectors and you need to have more than four, four K, if you will, on a display like our 32K wall, 
you either have to have the lights on in the room bright enough where you wash away that contrast difference, or you have to elevate the black levels. But what ends up happening is that when you turn the projector all the way, quote unquote, off, and it's just putting out that gray box, now if you overlap two projectors, now you have in that overlap zone twice the residual gray level. It's twice as bright in that gray level, or in the center where four projectors would come together, it actually is four times brighter. So either you elevate your black levels, which kills your 2001 contrast projector, becomes a 500 to one contrast system, or you have a real HDR system that black is black, and then there's no compromising to the image quality. And that's why we have six of these Christie Eclipse projectors in the Hayden Planetarium. And if you get to New York City, it's really one of those must-sees. Uh, they just launched their new show. I was just there a couple weeks ago. They launched their new show. We have um, six of these projectors. They've just created a new bit of content that really maximizes, that takes advantage of that system. Uh, they found they could not master it on their screens. They had to actually master it on the dome because that's the only way to see. They were seeing things on the dome that they could not see on their reference monitors. So it's, a, it's, it's really quite spectacular. Now, this is probably more to the heart of the, of the conversation. How many frames per second can we actually see? 24, 60, 120, 480? Is it more? So this was you know, 1878. This was the horse in motion. Of course, these are very, very still, crisp images. But that was the frame rate that we needed to have a minimum frame rate to be able to see motion and have our brains put it together. Why am I showing you about a talkie? This is a 3D thing. Why are we talking about talkies? Well, that's because it was the first movie with sound, and sound is the reason why 24 frames per second was chosen as the standard. Not because of some magical vis visual quality, it's because we needed the optical soundtrack to A, be co uh, consistent, and it also had to be faster than the 16 or 18 frames that it was typically uh, played back at, or even hand crank, where they would crank, over crank and under crank, depending on the scene, keep it in time with the orchestra in the pit. So the studios really didn't want to do that because it cost them more money, because it's a lot more film to have 24 frames versus 16 frames a second or 18 frames a second. But it was the only way to have acceptable sound quality. Well, we've long moved away from using optical soundtracks, except for it's still the standard. And it's, there's, been, there's lots of reasons why we need to move beyond that. So back in the 50s, 55 and 56, they made two movies at a whopping 30 frames a second. And actually, I've seen parts of Oklahoma at 30 frames a second. And it's spectacular. It's so much sharper than 24. And of course, it's, not a, it's, a, it, it's a logarithmic. It's not a linear scale between lower frame rates and higher frame rates. There's a logarithmic curve. But 30 frames was proven to be much better, but not a lot of theaters could show it. And it's proper 30 frame, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, 3D, all these have been 24 frame per second movies. And there's been a long history of 3D films. And Avatar was shot in dual camera, and, and it was really quite spectacular. And they were, James Cameron worked exceedingly well within the limitations of 24 frames per second. But we want to make things sharper and more realistic. And 24 frames a second is not going to get us where we need to be. So in the days of film shooting, when we were shooting film, I don't mean movies, I mean film, there would be a shutter in the camera because the film had to be exposed and then move from section to section. So you could have up to 180 degrees, but you couldn't have more than 180 degree shutter. This just really equates to shutter speed. And that's really what, when people say, I'm shooting with a 360 shutter or 180 shutter, or 270 shutter, that all refers to the amount of, amount of time that, that it, the imager is exposed. And of course, the higher, you get higher pan rates or motion rates in degrees per second as far as sharpness when you have effective resolution. So 
obviously a still image, one frame a second is just fine. Doesn't matter what the frame rate is on a still image. The question is when you're making movies that move, the motion in the scene or the motion of the camera all get blurry. So what they do is they either increase the shutter angle to get a smoother motion. Of course, by doing that, you are reducing your, your exposure time or increasing your exposure time, which makes for a very blurry looking image. It's a very, it becomes very soft and smooth, except all your action is lost. So the idea of adding higher, more frames is that you are able to get, instead of a longer exposure time, you get shorter exposure times and many more of them, and that actually increases much more realism. So the current high frame rate visionaries, Doug Trumbull is clearly the pioneer of high frame rate, creating ShowScan. ShowScan was not a, necessarily a major commercial success because ShowScan was film and 70 millimeter film and it was expensive and there was a lot of physical momentum of moving the objects through, moving the film through the camera and through the projectors was very difficult on all the equipment. And so it was very expensive, but the quality of it was incredible. This is only 2D. And of course, Peter Jackson came out with The Hobbit, mixed reviews, There's, this is a, uh, a, a new uh, storytelling method, but he went to 48 frames a second. And then Ang Lee, who I've been working with for five years, actually said, you have to have higher frame rate. So Ang Lee made Life of Pi, and it was a beautiful film, and it won Academy Awards, including Best Visuals. It was really an incredible film. But he was very frustrated by the filmmaking process because you had to work at 24 frames a second. You had to lock off the camera or limit the motion because as soon as things were happening, they would blur out. So he learned to work within the medium. It was his first 3D movie, but he said, we have to be able to create something better than that. So Doug Trumbull created the Magi format. And you're going to look at some Magi content in a little bit. Um, it's the Magi process basically takes two cameras. And because the projector is showing left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, it's captured in a way that is left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, only the, the ca each camera is open for 180 degrees or half the amount of time and then it moves to the other image. So what you get is a very smooth motion because the projector is playing it back in sequence. Now when we got here this morning, we were looking at some of the content and it didn't work. And I'm like, what's going on? This is not right. And the, the regular 60 frame, even though they're captured at the same time and played back at different times, look better. We discovered we had some cable swapped and we were getting the left eye content to the left eye, but it was coming after or it's coming before the, the right eye content. So it was getting this really odd, odd sensation. And you know, at still images, you can't tell. But as soon as things were moving, it was clearly evident that that was wrong. So what we're going to look at is actually corrected now. So Doug Trumbull made U Photog with little, it's a short film, but it was something he created to be able to showcase what this technology looks like. This has been seen at a number of film festivals, and this was really the first film to really be pioneered in a 3D, 120 temporal frame rate way. And as I was mentioning, Ang Lee, he wanted to be twice as bright. Most movie theaters show 2D at 14 foot Lamberts. That's the brightness on the screen. Most 3D films are typically at three or four foot Lamberts. The reason why is the flicker is very painful at higher brightness rates. The lack of motion blur, the other artifacts that, that come up. But Eng says, if you can, we can go to 28 foot Lamberts, twice as bright as 2D. And actually I've tested this up to 500 foot Lamberts. There's no issues. The, the key is having high frame rate enables you to go to better, brighter screens. And of course, there's a lot more data. So a normal movie, an average movie, a 2K movie is 53 million pixels per second. This movie is 2.2 billion pixels per second to the eyes, 
each eye is getting 1.1 billion pixels to each eye. That fidelity is very, very visible. Unfortunately, I don't have any of that content to show you at full resolution today, but we'll show you something that I still think will, will be good. So he made Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, it was a sort of experimental film uh, released at the end of 2016, and we had dual Mirage 4K projectors on set because that was the only way for him to actually master the film, to see what was going on. And he edited the whole movie on Mirage 4K because there were no cinema projectors. And of course, because there were no cinema projectors, almost nobody got to see it in the proper format. We only had five theaters in the world set up temporarily with the special projection technology that allowed for 120 frames per second per eye. And it's one of those things that's really quite, in, quite incredible to see. Of course, a few months ago, Gemini Man came out Critics were very harsh on the film, but audiences actually really enjoyed the film. And there were 14 theaters that were showing it at 2K 120. We had one screening at the Chinese theater, TCL Chinese theater in Hollywood, in the proper format at 4K 120 per eye at 28 foot Lamberts that we set up temporarily for the premiere of the show, but it was never shown domestically at 4K 120 per eye 3D. So, Gemini Man, we're going to look at a clip. So, that should have looked very different than most 3D content. It has a lot more detail. That was only HD, running 60 per eye, but temporally offset. So, that was in the Magi format, where each eye was getting 60, but the brain was seeing 120 updates per second. And that should have looked very different than normal 3D movies. Now with that said, we actually developed a new standard because the DCI Cinema standard couldn't deliver 4K 120 frames per second. So we developed a new projection system that offered us bigger dynamic range um, and with 6001 contrast and 4K 3D at full 120 frames per second, also at high brightness. And in post-processing, there have been a lot of developments in post-processing as well of high frame rate, which is, which is really key. And I think no matter what, one has to create content for a cinematic environment, for this type of realistic environment. You have to create content at 120 frames per second. Whether you play it back at 120 frames per second, that will take time. But capture it at 120 because it actually makes the editing process better. And in many cases, it makes the CG process even better because instead of rendering a lot of subframes that you're blurring together, you just render the frames and play it back the way it's supposed to. So the opportunities. It is a new method of storytelling. I always refer to this as a new storytelling medium because it really is a new way of telling stories. Ang Lee in particular is very excited about 3D and I would love to see 3D as well as he would love to see 3D really come back the way it's supposed to. 24 frame per second is not enough to get 3D to do what it's supposed to do. However, at higher frame rates, all the problems of 3D really go away. So no strobing, no flicker, unwanted blur. You can still have a natural blur in the image, but it eliminates the unwanted part of it. It really is a more intimate visual experience where it feels like you're looking more like in, directly into someone's eyes. When, you're, when you see the content, unfortunately, we don't have the, like the full movie, but when you see content, you can look at someone in their eye and really feel like you're communicating with them on stage. In Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk, Steve Martin was on the screen 25 feet tall on his image and it was, he was in your face and yelling at you, but not in your face like bad CG, bad 3D where you're uncomfortably close. It was, he was in your face like someone's really yelling at you and it felt, it raised your emotional level. And there was a lot of military scenes in Billy Lynn's Long Halftime Walk where I had many soldiers say, it's kind of bringing PTSD back uh, because it's so real, it's so immersive. So it really is a new visual experience. There's a lot more realism. It does have a different look. It is a double-edged sword. It is better. It's real and different. And unfortunately, being different 
Unfortunately, by the critics, they don't want to change their old standard of 24, and there is nothing magical about that. If you remember back in the day when we went from standard definition TV to high definition television, when HD first came out, people rejected it and said, oh my God, it looks terrible, the news looks awful, everyone's makeup, I'm looking at all the, all the junk on the walls, I can see all the problems. And now people are pushing for not only 4K TVs at home, but now 8K TVs at home. So there's a whole movement where people have adopted higher static resolutions, but people are not used to the sharper, more realistic look of the content with full resolution. It's much more realistic, but it is a new storytelling technique which requires different, different process. So right now we're still ahead of we're st it's still ahead of the, it, its time. We don't have movie theaters out there. They, uh, there are some, and they're getting there, but it's difficult to show it in its proper format. Makeup, less is more, because you'd really see everything. Because when you have makeup on the screen, it looks like you're wearing makeup on the screen. You can't really hide it, you can't fake it. But for sets, more is more, because you really do see everything. So if you have a wall that's painted like bricks, it will look like a wall painted with bricks instead of a wall that's actually a brick wall. So you have to actually step up the filmmaking process as well because it doesn't hide things. So you have to, it really is a new art form. It changes the acting. It changes the lighting. And of course there's data storage because it's a lot more resolution. However, data storage is getting cheaper and cheaper by the day. So, and biggest challenge right now is that few movie theaters and really no home TVs can properly display the content. So those are some of the challenges that we, we have right now. So I just want to say we're actually, we are actually and we are all facilitating illusionists because creating 3D is not, there is no 3D object there, but we're tricking our brains into seeing 3D. So just the way I showed those optical illusions at the beginning, this is all about a all about the artifice, all, all about illusions and creating a different environment. Light and perception are all relative. So we saw better color here. Well, we didn't really see better color here because this is Rec. 709. When you really see a Rec. 2020 display, you go, oh, now I understand what that's about. I understand what the deep red, now I know what red is, is really red. You know, if you're looking at a character, uh, you know, uh, a, a race car, whatever, you're looking at it and it's bright red or it's green, you see those reds and greens really clearly and it looks completely different. Even though you can sort of average it out and optical illusion cover, cover things, it's still not the same as, as when you see it. And it's really a combination of many factors and to do proper 3D, it's brightness, resolution, viewing distance, contrast, color volume, 3D technique, lighting, camera movement, etc. There's all these different pieces that come together. So to create really good, compelling 3D content, one has to touch each one of those pieces. It's not any, there is no one magical nirvana. And I didn't really talk about 3D because everyone who's in the room is an expert on 3D, at least at some level, they understand 3D at a, at a deep level. But it's really about all of the other aspects to create a realistic image, to really make it feel like you're there, to really make it feel compelling and to change acting and everything else. So those are some of the challenges and those are some of the opportunities. And I really do feel like we're at the beginning of a new storytelling medium format where film used to be black and white and, and herky-jerky and then it came you know, talkies and then came color and widescreen and played around with Cinerama and different formats and the large screen formats, the 15 per 70 formats. But we're really at a, at a a new level where we can bring things to a, to another level of realism. And I think that's what is very exciting about this, is that we are really at a new place where we can do things.